Welcome to the after talk party. Uh, we all uh, just listened to my favorite educator, John Baez, uh, talk about the tenfold way, which is to say bot periodicity. I am Andrus Kulikauskas. This is Math for Wisdom. Have fun with us. We're going to share our impressions. So uh, who'd like to start? Okay. Great, yes. I would be interested. Um, Andres, I have to start with an apology. I let my ego uh, not allow me or prevent me from answering from the very first uh, emails you sent, which was which introduced me to this team. It mm -hmm. got bruised a little bit. I was like, oh, it hurts. And, and I didn't. And then, you know, sometimes I was getting a bit antagonistic. So I, I want to put that in the table. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, well I, I'll accept any, other, any apology but, people know. will give me. I'll gladly accept <laughs> if I don't have to understand them. But uh, you're, you're a great, uh, I mean, we have a small world here, four people. Hopefully we get to see Bill. But um just want to say everyone is very precious at, you know and and i think that's the value of starting so small and humbly is i'm really led to appreciate every person and you know that each one of us is contributing so first of all i just want to say how amazing it is you know i thought that thomas and uh, john who can't be with us here but i thought they'll understand a lot you know i had trouble understanding many things but you see you see i've pre been preparing for years you know but that you and bill stuck through almost two hours of the highest level math talk you know it's very impressive and i think it's like listening to a foreign language for two hours you know and maybe understanding two percent i don't know but i think that but this is how children learn so this is like this is the path of absorbing and learning like if you hear clifford algebras a hundred times you start to realize there's something about those clifford algebras so I don't know. I'm curious here. What did you draw from all this? What did you learn? Um... Uh, Bill, do you want to go first? Hold on, let me um, uh, mute my Facebook. Bill, okay. what did you get from all this? How did you... Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes. Good, good, good. Sorry, sorry. It took me a, it took me a little longer to get connected here, and then I couldn't hear you for half a That's minute. That's fine. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I did hear a lot of the same terms repeated. Mm -hmm. and, uh, there was a discussion about those terms. So, like, which terms did you remember? Oh, this, uh, you got me on the spot here. Hold on a second. There was a couple of them. Uh, I don't want to get it wrong. Give it so, a shot. <laughs> the periodicals, the uh, bot, but. And what periodicity I talk about yeah yeah I don't know if he talked about that but it was that was that whole picture the eighth circle is called bot yeah. periodicity sure sure but sure he spoke very little about it he, mentioned yeah, he didn't like, talk about it but, but the, times yeah but if you know yeah, the, I, but I always talk about it that's how I talk about it yeah. now I, I'm a little self-conscious because what I should have done is I should have been taking some notes and I didn't so I, I don't want to no that's I don't want to put my what what did you what did you think of him as an educator, as a teacher? What did you think? He, he, seemed, he seemed a little shy about uh, the subject. Like he, he didn't he kind of repeating it. He didn't want to get into it too deeply, or he didn't want to get it into into it the wrong way. Mm -hmm. And I thought it just felt like he was a little shy about the material. And uh, I, I'm sure he knows it quite well. Tom, Thomas, what did you think of him as an educator? I think he's really good in the sense that he tries to avoid overcomplicating things by throwing in definitions which are too long mm -hmm. to be written up on a on a slide on half a slide actually and that was the best part I think of the whole talk that I could have some feeling of understanding maybe 40% of the talk okay and That's... some of the connections, I mean, I wouldn't say that it's only 5%, but when it came to the real definitions, I have don't have the experience of working with them. So mm -hmm. I was missing out on some of the parts and especially some of the 
proof in the end because that right. is not that short. And then some of the things that were discussed, like in which sense is it disjoint or not disjoint, is like, mm, I don't deal with the, I would say, mathematical structure like that. I'm more dealing on the level that he explained in the end that how physicists would approach it. Mm -hmm. So this is how I would understand it. And yeah. So the, I'll be, I prepared two slides, which, you know, you may understand. I think, you know, we'll all understand at least one of them uh, because uh, we've been working on the binomial theorem. But um, how about you, Harris? Uh, what did you... Uh, I I did at the moment. Okay, this is going to sound maybe a bit funny. Um, I did look up at some point when I was really desperate. I looked up Hilbert spaces. Mm -hmm. That was my starting point. I did physics about I'm at the bachelor's level. My bachelor's was physics and philosophy. So I, there was something to latch on towards the Hilbert spaces, which I was like, I need to start from somewhere. Um. There were some, you know, sequences of things where I could sort of say, like, oh, yeah, that sort of, you know, relates somehow. Mm -hmm. um, but I, and definitely, I think, uh, um, definitely, I think with more friction, or it's what you described earlier, that, like, you know, the ways of, I mean, lower the volume of it because I've got the window open. So um, it's the way that people learn or the way I used to learn from lectures or something, like, you know, when I was in, oh, from seminars, like I invited seminars mm -hmm. in Bristol, in the Bristol philosophy department, mm -hmm. where we had, um, you know, philosophy of biology, logicians, philosophy of mathematics, and they would come and give us a talk and then we would grill them. Mm. Um, part of it, part of the talk, it was like the structure of the seminar was one hour or well, 55 minute talk, five minutes break, and then or 50, 50, 10, and one hour where it was a uh, discussion. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So if you follow enough of these, you begin to be conversant in other sub disciplines, in you know, you mm -hmm. begin to have mm -hmm. so this was. Um, along, like it supplements or it guides a bit, like what you write, like Andrews in the, you know, in the in the discussions we have in the group. Mm -hmm. Although you're taking it, you know, you take the extra step, which I think he wasn't, he didn't want to take with consciousness, with choice, with these things which normal mathematicians may shy away from mm -hmm. for various reasons, which can describe, you know, which we can discuss, you know. Mm -hmm. later or at other times um so i did get i did get a starting point but all contact is good i guess you know next time i think i will have something that right will come back this is to me so this is about say, yeah, immersion this is yeah, about immersion i would call it immersion yeah i would call yeah. it immersion yeah and and the or my sister sometimes says imprinting, you know, you know, like, like, but um, that is why I'm so happy that we did this. I'm very grateful to you and Bill, especially, uh, you know, and also to Thomas and John, but uh, that it shows that in a loving environment, it's possible, you see, like for people to, because obviously you thought it was meaningful, you know, to, to spend the time. And so obviously there's something about the no, no, it was just the patient. No, not meaningful. No, any sort of. I would, I would like to think that I have the patience to hear many things. To see what I okay, mean. Okay, so you obviously, I mean, you passed the patience test. So that's you that's, know, that's, you, so get that's <laughs> you know that I would like, I would like to see. It, um, you know, the decision would be if I go or if I don't go. But even that, if I have the time, I will go. Mm -hmm. And then it will be for me. It's like staying until the end of the film. It's disrespectful to walk away. Oh, well, that's I it's feel bad. disrespectful to the speaker as well. well. At least, at least that's why they that's they would I, they I would understand. Know. I think I do, I can just give an example. Maybe others can give other examples of patience. But um, 
a few weeks ago, and, and Bill was with me, uh, we went to the reform space Vilnius, which is a new space that uh, newcomers from Russia who are fleeing from Putin's yeah. government, you know, have set up a wonderful uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. co-working space. Yeah. And then I went there once just to see an event, which was in Russian. It was about 12 people. There was a documentary film in Russian. I do not know Russian, just maybe like the alphabet. And yeah. I stayed for two hours, you see, listening to people talking in Russian. Um, but okay. my yeah. attitude was, you know, well, I want to learn Russian. It's not going to hurt. You know, I mean, I don't know if I'll ever learn Russian, but it's a step towards that. And yeah. I wanted people to know I care. And I want the organizer to know I care. If I stay there for two hours, he's going to know that guy cares, you see. Yeah. And yeah, he got definitely. that impression. Definitely. Everyone got. And then, you know, I they know English. So I was able to make some comments in English, invite them to the meeting we had. And that went well. Yeah. So. Uh, but it's a similar, you know, type of situation, uh, I guess. I don't know if you no, have other definitely. examples. And they definitely need the support. They definitely need the support. Yeah. Like, especially this real world situation that you described. I mean, you know, we can talk academia all we want. I mean, that's a real, you know, real significant thing. It's not fluff in the air. Or and so, so like what you and Bill did, and I want to thank and welcome Bill uh, today, is his birthday as a Patreon supporter. Oh, so he's our my oh, okay. uh, second Patreon supporter, giving clack. And he's my first one who's not anonymous, you know, so I can I can brag about uh, my Patreon supporter. The other one is anonymous. I really can't talk much about that. <laughs> but, uh, so, um, oh, and I lost my train of thought, but, um, oh, but the, the bigger gift, you know, so, and I, I wrote a post that, you know, Bill is a, supporter you know with of many gifts but so this is a huge gift like that you spent two hours of your time to support math for wisdom community to say you know yeah this will be fun i mean fun is the wrong word but this will be a this is a social this is a family thing that we can be like a family so uh and then the people really watching us are part of that family too so to speak they're participating in the family as important as Hold on, as important as Math for Wisdom is, I should keep an eye on the score Liverpool is playing. Okay. That's, that's, okay. That's, Liverpool. that's life or death. Intersecting Liverpool. families. <laughs> what other families do we belong to? One, one, a friend of mine was in Liverpool last weekend, and uh, he sent oh. me some pictures. Okay, I, nice. I was in Liverpool mentally and for eurovision who watched eurovision oh ooh, i watched it i watched it and they sang you'll never walk alone you'll never walk yeah that's i looked it up on the internet uh i learned all about oh, them you never walk alone you should i should send you know where it comes from it moves, uh it's from a musical i think uh yeah, it's supposed to be one of the 40s. greatest musicals it's called carousel yeah 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 it's still zero zero though uh, Thomas, did you did your family watch Eurovision? No. Nope. Nope. <laughs> no, that's not. So, <laughs> so what are what 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 intersects? What are your communities or families that you? Well, my biological family. Yes. So wife and children. I would say then the activities where my kids participate, for instance, Opus Dei or Focolare, somewhat. Uh -huh. Mm -hmm. So that was the busy part of the weekend. First going to a school ex, uh, excursion of the youngest daughter with her. Then on the next day, a grilling with, with the, the, I mean, I mean outdoor, outdoor grilling with, with the mm -hmm. son who finished the activity, activity with a poste and, and then to a family discussion, discussion where they, where they, they organize, organize a summer camp in, with Focolare. So, so this, this, this is where I am. Uh, but, but I was, I was busy, busy and not watching, watching anything, anything of this. this. Neither the football, football, nor soccer, nor <laughs> a revision contest or something <laughs> like that. It's, you have real people was, in your life. <laughs> no, it's... I mean, these are also real people, but uh, they... It becomes too much of a burden when trying to be everywhere. It's, I mean, it's, it's too much for me. So uh, I can, can say, say uh, Thomas is a very, very special person in my life. About, about, about once, once a month, month I get to visit him and tell him, him he's kind of like a research, research advisor who listens to his student, student you know, so, so I, I tell him about, about my work, work in theology, philosophy, mathematics, physics. And so, so he, so it's a very great gift. 
And so uh, you saw, like, I asked questions today. I learned a lot. Uh, but mm -hmm. so the first question I asked uh, was very helpful because I learned um, there's one thing going on on the mathematics level that's written down. But there's another thing going on on the imagination level. And see, I was confusing the levels. So you can think of um, in the issue was like, you know, what they call representations, which kind of like multiplication tables, you know, like you can have a mathematical system, but you can also have a multiplication table, let's say. Right. And they're on two different levels, so to speak. So so I was confusing the levels and I was. And so when when you do that, you see, oh, there's this mental level. There's this mental space that could be carved up, for example. So that was very helpful because I'm trying to show how that eight cycle is carving up mental space. So first of all, that was good. I learned. But then in the other questions, you know, I talked about modeling choice. You see, I think he kind of knows who I am, and I think he kind of thinks I'm a crank, you see, because I'll say, but see, so I was able to kind of show, hey, you know, like, I may be a crank, but, you know, I'm able to, I'm able to ask questions, you know, in an environment where, like, not so many people want to ask questions, you know, so. Andrews, we're on the right curve. I'm going to ask you, I mean, you, you, you do want to attract attention from the videos of that. Uh -huh. Like, you know, like with, in you know, with the dresses and the thing. Oh, I think part of I that. Mean, you see um, what I mean? You see what I mean? That's to attract, you know, the crankiness part. Oh, crank? Crank, crank, crank is an English word that means uh, somebody who is has a fixed idea that limits their, like, for I'll give an example. Um, you had an idea about the Pythagorean theorem, right? Which was a creative idea. You talk to experts. It turned out that there's a long way to go in developing that idea. Like it's a glimmer of an idea. It's not clear. Now, if you were a crank, you would spend your whole life talking about like, hey, I have this idea for the Pythagorean theorem. No one understands me, you see, which maybe is true, do you see? But but the point is, is that it's a social thing. Like, so he, he looks at me working on my philosophy, you know, so someone like Thomas, who's a renowned uh, theoretical physicist in Lithuania, you know, he spends time with. So he makes me feel like uh, I'm not a crank. See, it makes me feel like uh, validated. It's very important, just one person. See, so I go there, there were 60 people there. I'm able to ask these questions. It means like, hey, like, I know something about what I'm talking about. Because, and he 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 gave, and he, he could, if he could have said, you know, he could have brushed me aside, but he didn't, you see. And so that uh, I just felt uh, validated. Like next time I talk to him, next time I write to him, he might not ignore me or he might not, you know, because he'll know that, oh, he I knows what he's doing. I hope so. Yeah, I, hope yeah. So. I felt I got the impression. That's just my. But, but well, I, yeah. I, I want to tell now something about that. I have the impression also that he doesn't or wouldn't consider you in that sense somebody that only wants attention, but that has a question and honestly asks it and is open for an answer. Mm -hmm. And he's not trying to steer away the talk that he had prepared or the subject that he was talking. But you are asking about the subject. Mm -hmm. So as a, I would say as a good educator, he takes it seriously and tries mm -hmm. to answer the best. So I think that's the appropriate reaction to do that and not well, and brush so, things aside. So when you, when you, when you... You know, when you learn about this person, why he's just so lovely, fascinating, because you can see he's a rare mathematics educator who's really like interested in the big picture, you know, really has opinions, you know, really has uh, emotions and really has dedicated to learn many different things. He was known uh, for um, uh, as an early mathematics blogger. I think he blogged like for 10 years, uh, this uh, these articles, this week's finds. So every week he would write about it. He became like the most important mathematical blogger. Uh, and so people love his talks and everything. So when I started uh, in about 2016, I started to just go back to math. I have a PhD, but I went back and I have these structures and I found, oh, there's an eight cycle here. Well, I have an eight cycle. How do they, do they relate or not? And see, the more I learned about it, the more I go, well, it's possible because I have an eight cycle of frameworks of perspectives. Now, when you look at all these symmetrical things or all these choices or whatever you see, like mapping spheres to spheres, for example. Well, spheres could be like perspectives, you see. So um, so just more and more the evidence seems to, or like, you know, topological insulators. Like, for example, it turns out that these things appear in physics and they appear in questions like, well, 
suppose that you reverse time, do things change or not? You know, does the material, does the material tell, can the material tell if you were to reverse time or not? Some materials can and some materials can't. Can you tell if, um, uh, if, here's another one, like, if you have a particle, and if you have a sea of antiparticles, there's a hole in it, right? Like, it's a sea of antiparticles, but the hole, the hole is positive, right? So you have a positive hole, or you have, like, say, a positive particle. Are they the same thing, or are they different things? You know, so does something exist, or is it the same as it not being there? You know, like this kind of thing. So this materials will tell you all these philosophical questions, you know, like becoming and being and all these things. So, so that's encouraging for me. Um, and that's why, that's why I'm, it's, you, it's very hard to learn these things, but any other comments or things? I would show you um, maybe a slide that would maybe help to make this more concrete. Is that fine? Yes, we're going. Okay. Wait, I, yeah, and so uh, you're familiar with the binomial theorem, right, uh, uh, Harris, or a little bit? Quite a bit. Quite a bit. So I don't remember it. Sure I'll show you. It's the one that, like the Pascal's the, triangle. The Galilea. Exactly. Yeah, Pascal's triangle. Yeah, I've seen it recently also when you shared it. But yeah, the one to one is going to the power. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So I want to pick up yeah. this. Oh, here I have it. Do you see this picture with the numbers on it? One, two, three, four? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So the point of this is, um, okay, so do you know what four factorial means? Four exclamation mark? Uh, yes, it's uh, the, what you write next to it. It's four yeah. times three times Four two times three times two. Are you familiar with that, Bill? Um, four factorial that, is a way of writing four times three times two times one. You're familiar with that. You've seen that before. Yes. So what is four times three times two times one, Bill? What is that? Equal to. Well, factorial. Uh, I don't have my calculator. On my I'll do it. Let's do a step by step. So two times one is two. What's three times two? Six. Six. And what's four times six? Uh, 24. Very good. Okay, not everybody knows, but um, but we're we we are where we are. So, four factors twenty four. Now, what is the twenty four counting? Do you know? Um, I'll tell you. Yeah. So the sequence is one factorial is one, two factorial is two, three factorial is six, four factorial is twenty four, five factorial is one hundred twenty, etc. So if you have a number one like this, there's only one way to write one, okay, in order. This is only one. <laughs> but if you have one and two, there's two ways you can order them. You can go one, two, or you can go two, one. Does that make sense? But if you have three numbers, there's six ways you can order it. It can be one, two, three, uh, one, three, two, two, one, three, two, three, one, three, one, two, three, two, one. That's six ways. Now, if you have four, then you get 24. Okay. And this is the red numbers here. There's 24 ways to organ, you know, to order them. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, there's a special thing that the binomial theorem does. And you know, you both know Pascal's triangle. And if you go, um, if you go x plus y to the fourth, so you take x plus y times x plus y, what do you get if you go x plus y times x plus y? Do you know what that looks like? X plus uh, y? Roughly. Yeah. X plus y times x plus y. And it, so maybe I should draw it, but basically if we do it in our head, like it's x squared plus xy plus yx plus y squared. There'll be four terms. Yeah. It's two times two terms, it's four terms. And so there'll be an xy at one end, there'll be a y squared at another end, and there'll be two xy if you commute them, if you change the order. If you go x plus y cubed, there will be a one x cubed plus three x squared y plus three x y squared plus one y cubed. And if you add it up, there's eight of them. One plus three plus three plus one is eight. Then if you go x plus y to the fourth, you get one x to the fourth plus four x 
cubed y plus 6 x squared y squared plus 4 x y cubed plus 1 y to the fourth. So in the middle, there was this little 6 that came out, 6 x squared y squared. So what the 6 x squared y squared means, when you make four choices, like let's say it's flipping a coin, a heads or tails, you know, heads or tails, right? If you flip a coin four times, there'll be uh, 16 possibilities. Two times two times two times two is 16 things. And six of those will be two heads and two tails in different orders. So it could be like um, the first one and the second one could be heads and the third and the fourth could be tails or the first and the third could be heads or the first and the fourth could be heads or the second and the third could be heads or the second and the fourth could be heads or the third and the fourth could be heads. These are all the heads and these are all the tails. Does that make sense? There's six okay. ways. So it turns out that the formula is, and you know, I won't prove it here, but four factorial is 24 divided by two factorial is two divided by two factorial. Two plus two is four. So it kind of breaks down like that. Four factorial divided by two divided by two. So that is uh, 24 divided by four is what? Six. Six. Okay. So there's going to be, these are the six. So it all works out magically, beautifully, etc. And so these are choices. You are listing out ways of choosing a subset. If the subset has four, you know, if there's four heads, it, it was heads all the time. If it has no heads, it was head none of the time. It's an empty set, you see, and you could have different versions of sets. So there's six subsets which have two elements. There's six ways to choose two out of four. Now, what does that mean? Um, I mean, it means a lot of things, but one of the things it means is that when you have a one and a two, you chose the heads, you know, one and two, and you chose the tails three and four. Well, it doesn't matter if the one and two, it could be like two and one. The order doesn't matter. So long as the two doesn't go over into the other side. Does that make sense? Or like the three and four, if they stay on the second half, it could be four, three, it could be three, four. Or if this one stays one, two. They don't care about the, you know, when you do the choosing, they don't care about the order. That's what I'm trying to say. So instead of worrying about the ordering, you switch over to a different thing, which is these subsets. Okay, how many subsets do you have? Now, so that's why I was talking about modeling choice. This is a kind of much. Now, if you look here, what I've written, this is subspaces of a vector space. So this is now more for Thomas, maybe, but maybe you'll be able to understand something that's like, it's, you have an, let's say we have a four-dimensional vector space. Are you familiar with a vector space, Harris? Uh, not, not that much, no. Uh, maybe last year of uni, but that was 20 years ago. Like a vector space would be like, we live in a three-dimensional room, let's say, right? So that's a three-dimensional vector space. Like height is one vector, you know, height is one dimension, length, width. And so a vector yeah, space could be an arrow. In three dimensions. Yeah, what I struggle with, and the reason, like, mm -hmm. and you're probably going to get is if I am in the group, is with the higher vector spaces. Like, I, I have a big mental block, and that's why, like, in my whatever attempts I made at maths, I, I sort of struggled to imagine pictorially, and I sometimes extended into saying that I have difficulty with understanding like degrees of freedom in physics for so example I'll try, I'll try to, yeah I'll you know, try to... about four about four you know about the four that i can understand like you know three dimensions of time plus uh, uh space just plus one time. announcement uh, we're gonna get kicked off if you uh, oh. i'm gonna click on the link again you know when we get kicked off and we'll just join the same thing before okay so mm. um because i don't pay for zoom so but um the deal is is that um two dimensions you could live on a table that just be two dimensions right you could live on a line that'd be one dimension the yeah. crucial thing is like i had with um you know well, there's one thing going on in the math world and then there's another thing going on in the imagination world and like i got that confused and so um uh, john bias set me straight you know that uh, i'm i'm confused you know i'm i'm seeing things in the you know so i think a key thing is to let go of the imagination world. You don't need to imagine four dimensions. You just need to know how to do the math. You see, don't imagine four dimensions, just do the math. You see, and the math is just as easy in four dimensions as three dimensions. 
you see so you just have like an extra instead of adding you know length and width and height you know say length and width and height and uh, and uh flavor let's say and flavor is going to be a fourth dimension and you just have to add it right like please <laughs> You cannot have a, a language of wisdom and want it to be the only language of wisdom and then say it's just business as usual as, as what you can do with three dimensions. You do it with seven or 12 or 18 or 126. You know? I agree other, with you. I, I agree with you. I'm just saying that they're not doing the language of wisdom. They're doing the language of math. You see, and that's why it's very frustrating math because, uh, and that's why uh, he's a very rare educator. He kind of gave some intuition, you see, but most of the uh, very few, you know, basically uh, maybe never, you know, have I had math teachers who really gave me much intuition, like, you know, what the, of the kind that you want, it just doesn't exist, you know, uh, oftentimes, you know, so at, especially at these higher levels uh, or it's very private, you know, or I, I that's my experience, you know, other people have different experience, but um so, but he. Yeah, but we're trying. But we're trying here as well to work that through with what periodicity with things which are really abstract, at least you know. And you saw my questions. Like I was the one asking intuitive questions, right? Like, what's your intuition yeah, on choice, this? Uh, but you, know, you saw no one else was asking intuitive questions, well, right? Yeah. Why is that? Right? Like, <laughs> yeah. Like, like a simple question. Like, uh, so this is my you know world. So I want to explain though, like where. I'm looking, so I'm looking for that here, but I'm just saying like, in order to make progress in math, you have to be willing to let go of that, unfortunately. You know, if you want to play their soccer game, let's say, right? Like you can't, uh, you know, we're, we're trying to play a different game with Math for Wisdom. But... Can I say one more thing? The thing go that ahead, was please. missing from my round, the thing that was missing from my round, if you consider zero as a number, Mm -hmm. If you consider it, if you try to grade infinities, mm -hmm. um, who was it? Not Gauss, uh, the other guy, later than Gauss. Um, Cantor. Infinity. Tell me. Cantor, I think. Cantor, yeah, it was mm -hmm. Cantor with the grading infinities. Um, multiple dimensions from the as degrees of freedom. Of course, Thomas will know more about this. You're losing, you know, you're, you're losing something. You know, at least well, that's so, my, you know, this why came I up, was, you this, know. this came up for me, um, and I forget exactly when, but basically my understanding, you know, was that in as far as zero goes, like, you're right, like, zero is self-contradictory, you see, oh. at the level. But see, we work with zero on the meta level. So, like, for example, in category theory, um, in category theory, there's objects and arrows, and every object has an identity arrow. But the identity arrow is like a do-nothing action. Now, it's a very strange thing. You have a do-nothing action, which does nothing, but it exists. It has a name, and it has an existence. You see, that is okay on the meta level, on the bookkeeping level. You know, on the booking level, okay, I have zero dollars, right? Like, And I'm doing bookkeeping. Yeah. But you see, they're not working on the bookkeeping level. They're saying on the category level, there every object has a do nothing action that relates to it that tells you, and that's that tells you that it is an action. It's the do nothing action that's actually the most important thing about it. And the Uneda lemma will not work without that do nothing action. It depends on that. See, so then when you start realizing, no, that is a contradiction. And see, so for my philosophy, because I'm trying to more and more, I'm trying to really say, look, we start with contradiction. Then we do something like this bot periodicity. We carve, 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 carve mental space. And finally, with the seventh one, we get a system that has non-contradiction, but it's very fragile. Then when yeah. they introduce the, like he said, here's where we would like to introduce the Octonians. You kind of missed that point. I think you weren't on the call. Well, we stayed for the call. He said, there's this Octonian yeah. that have problems, you see. And they have problems. They're not associative, for example. You see, and okay, so Octonians are the double of quaternions, right? Yeah, they'd be the I'm next. I'm going to shoot myself. I'm going to shoot myself. And the other, and then Thomas maybe can enlighten us on that. Some I would be willing to listen to a whole 
Um, uh, I can't even on write this. with you on Octonians because I no, don't No, no, really no, 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 wait, wait, wait. It's okay. another thing. Sorry. It's on another topic. Yeah. Which is quantum mechanics and um, this, like, the, the contradiction that starts from, uh, and now you'll see, like, where my writings come from, which, which it was an old idea yes. that I had, which is how you can have something which is dimensionless and then you create length essentially from a point and then from these old ideas we've been led down to point particles which are now smashing themselves more and more and more and we've got this zoo of 52 or 260 particles and uh... we've got um and we've got also black holes so in physics, both, you know, but again, the sort of point, which we've not moved beyond the point, and I would really want to discuss this in the context of physics, you know? Okay. Yes, clearly. Um, because Please, I feel no, there's something, no. you know, that our concepts there, like, are breaking down, you know? Yes. And it starts, if you want, we can even pass from DX, which is this, shrinking to nothingness or some like something which is nothing and something you know that's yeah, why okay. i went and the, and the ex i had a problem for a long time like when i got my first crisis like let's call it epistemic or bipolar crisis in university which was the ex actually like i didn't like the ex essentially i was like how can you have in some, calculus something right? which is you know, yeah, calculus, yeah, the X over oh, okay. the, yeah, infinitesimals. Yeah, these are things that I would like to do. Okay, that would be subjecting you to my psychotherapy. But if mm. you see that it's something useful or interesting to discuss, I would love to to see your intuition, to explore it's... together. Yeah. You know, it's... Yeah. I mean, I can give one comment. This no dimensionless is an approximation that the physicist does of saying we don't have an ability to see any structure that is smaller like and then we have mathematics which can model it like a point saying we don't care what it is there but it's an approximation for simplicity of calculation yeah. if we start to think what it is I mean that's it we lose any context to what the real world should be we have always to keep this i would say this schizophrenia apart from us in order to calculate and say okay we can treat that as a model and say ah oh, this approximation is good in this way in this until this point yeah but and that goes for the black the... hole and also for the point particles yeah. it's all yeah, the that's the tragedy of physics, though, in the sense yes. that they have to marry mathematics and yes. the real world, right? It's, yes. You know, they have yes. to. But I wouldn't say it's a tragedy. It's the, it's the good success that we can make exact predictions. We can, without that, we don't have a tool to compare what we see with the next try, the next measurement that we do. Only with this tool, we can make comparisons between different experiments, between, between different places where we do the experiments and so on. We can find a language where we can be as exact as we want. And that's, a, it's, that's very interesting. And, and actually, Roger Penrose talks about this in his Road to Reality in the very beginning. And it's very nice how uh, Thomas says this, like, there's something in reality we want to be interested in. But to do measurements, we need a mind that can compare things, basically. To, to be able to express that mind, we need mathematics to you know, be able to come up with things. So there's like three different domains that you need to have in order to do anything. So this, when I say like you take a stand and follow through and reflect, see, Roger Penrose talks about that same structure basically, you know, in this way. But Thomas did it very nicely saying like, you know, if to do a measurement, you need a mind, basically. I think that's kind of, you know, the short maybe way to say it. But I want to give an example. So like the relationship between the mind and mathematics in the DX and the binomial theorem, you see, because the binomial theorem is a very nice way to think about that DX. So imagine like X plus Y cubed, you have a, you have a X cubed 
plus 3x squared y plus 3xy squared plus y cubed. And when you look at it, and so a cube is x cubed, right? Physically, you can think of a cube mm -hmm. as x cubed. Mm -hmm. So how does a cube grow? You see, which of those four terms is crucial when the cube grows? It turns out it's not the x cubed that's the interesting one. It's the 3x squared, that a cube has three faces, let's say, that could be growing. It actually has six faces, but let's say, you know, if you if you keep three of them fixed, but let's say, you know, if, if two of them are parallel, if, so if, you if can they have a thin face, like if the y is very thin, if the y is very mm -hmm. small, if the y is very thin, three x squared y will mean that there are three faces of the cube that have this very thin layer called y. And mm -hmm. then basically what calculus is saying is saying, yeah, and then just kind of let the y kind of like become less and less important. Right. And so, but it'll be those three faces that'll be important for the growth. So three X squared. So the derivative of X cubed is three X squared. The derivative of X squared is two X. The derivative, like in four dimensions, X to the fourth, it'll be the four X cubed that'll be important. You see, and the binomial theorem tells you that, but you just have to kind of, so if you, does that, I find that helpful. So oh, yeah. when we're studying the binomial theorem, you see, that's leading up to this bot periodicity. It's leading up to the carving of mental space. Yeah, but I don't know. I mean, my, like you said before, like you need a mind to make the measurement and you need mathematics to express the mind. To express the mind. That would be where I would say, no, you need a language to express the mind. And well, so math is really a math is a language of nature. That's math the idea. Is, it's a language. Math is of, math is a language. Yeah, it's a language, but it's a language among other languages. So it's like, a, it's, like and you know, it's a, a more pro. You know, you may have seen this. Well, so it's before, the language. I mean, there may be better languages, but it's the language that works very well with physics. You know, maybe there's a better one. But it no, certainly but works better be than historical. English. That you know, might be a historical. That might be a historical. It could be historical. And, you know, situa but... situated fact, like in the fact, in the sense that, you know, you had observations on nature, you had mathematics as an object of curiosity, and then these came together in natural they philosophy did. by uh, Newton. So, and then they advanced, you know, then they got the. Or Galileo, of, even, or yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Galileo, Galileo, you know, that the language of nature is mathematics, and then they stuck with this idea. You know, and they, they stayed with this idea. So I remember, I don't know if I pointed it out, I wanted to say this, that until very recently, mathematics was actually described, like the language in which mathematics was presented mm -hmm. was more in terms of, let's say, riddles, word, mm. like um, fables yeah. with, a, you know, things like that. It wasn't at all equations and things like and yeah, yeah. You know, i mean they they came like 100 or 120 years ago when the with the formalization yeah. of logic yeah yeah the formalization yes. so this and this yes. is my approach that's why my criticism of science is a young thing i mean okay i yes it I is put my hands up i put out my hands up i'm a relativist i mean don't you know i know a bit of science but i criticize it often and you will Good. get that and feel free to tell me harry's we won't take any of this because <laughs> no uh, that's interesting you know, but no, we're we're benefiting a lot from your good yes. questions, and this is a good environment for that. So I'm very grateful for this after. But I just wanted to put this slide up again to show. So we kind of understand the binomial theorem. We kind of understand the choice here. But see, it turns out that you can have choosing subspaces of a vector space. Oh, so you mentioned Hilbert space. So a Hilbert space. I mean, so. We talked about a four-dimensional space and how would you take a derivative? It'd be four X cubed, you know, in a 10-dimensional space you mm. could do, you know, it'd be in whatever. Then the next step is like, well, Hilbert space, it says, why not have an infinite dimensional space? You see where you have an infinite. Uh, so that's kind of crazy. Then you can say like, well, instead of real numbers, why don't we use complex numbers? And often complex numbers are more natural. Why don't we use quaternion numbers, right? So there's these different flavors of numbers. So then the point is, is that when we have a vector space, like a four-dimensional space, we could carve it up into a pair of two-dimensional spaces. Okay. And now when you do vector spaces, I think one of the, and you look at maps and you look like transforming, whatever. 
one of the crucial things is that zero goes to zero. So zero is a trivial vector space within the vector space. It's like the zero dimensional <laughs> space. Uh, and so uh, zero is almost like this everything that I have that I try to carve up. You know, it's like zero. And I is want to like... make a comment. Don't try to imagine what it means, a zero dimensional vector space. For me, it drives me <laughs> crazy. Yes. Okay. I, I mean, Thanks. Thanks. But in the formalism, I can follow the steps and the ways of writing it up. But I refuse to try to imagine it. Okay, but I so get, I but, get sick. Okay, so so and there's these two levels, right? Like so. Yeah, so now, now one of the things uh, Thomas asked about the talk, you know, and one of the things came up. So it turns out that there were different ways of um, picking subspaces of a vector space. Okay, different and depending on the different flavors of the vector space. Like so, you could have a complex vector space, but you could maybe look at the real subspaces, or you could have a real vector space, but see like what would be the spaces that are compatible that could be complex as let's say whatever so i don't know about all these flavors but i just have to know i have to learn about them but so orthogonal o means orthogonal it means basically like yeah. rotation so all these things that when they say compact basically means that they don't go off into whatever they're all bounded and then they're all basically rotations of space so if you have four dimensions and you're rotating them well you could break it up into maybe two vector spaces that are two dimensional and rotate them, you see, separately. Okay. And then it turns out like here, it doesn't matter what you did with the rotations. What becomes interesting is the way they fit together. Just like over here, you know, it doesn't matter whether the one goes first or two goes first, the ordering stops to matter. But the fact is, is that there's six ways to pick two out of four. There's four ways to pick three out of four. There's one way to pick four out of four, right? So different ways you break it down, you're going to get different answers. So it turns out the same way here. Different ways you, let's say N plus M is four. If N and M are two and two, you'll get one breakdown. But if N and M are three and one, you'll get another breakdown. If N and M are four and this horrible zero, you'll get another breakdown. So there's different ways of breaking this down. So then you have to take the disjoint union. That's why he was taking, you know, because, and see, like he was saying uh, later when you weren't here, Harris, uh, he said, a lot of times they like to just forget about this N and M and just work with zero infinity. But then they don't get to see this detail that he thought was very important, that actually, if you fix a particular, let's say four, you have to look at all the ways that four can break down into two spaces. So you're going to get like the five different versions that I talked about. So you're going to have to be, and then see when you go, when you're doing these maps, you're mapping from different spaces to different flavors of spaces. It becomes a problem. I got five different possibilities of how to break this down. How do I, what do I do? You know, like what's, what's giving me the right answer? It turns out he had to deal with that mathematically. I still kind of trying to figure out what he did, but so that Thomas, does that help in terms of what uh, you were saying? Uh in some way it explain i think it sums it explains something which i think i grasp in some way mm -hmm. uh, like in some way like following your philosophy i can it makes kind of sense but i don't see the explicit example right so constructing so in, this space explicitly is beyond my and then he also said like these types so what these are doing these are basically comparing two spaces and saying that mm -hmm. One is like a zero, it doesn't matter. So when we say this two-dimensional rotation is not going to matter, it's kind of like saying like it doesn't matter whether the one or two goes first or whatever, so long as they stay in the box. So long as these rotations stay in the two dimensions, we don't care what they are. They might as well just be fixed. Just keep them fixed. So that's that's what uh, this is saying. And he when I, I talked about spin structures, because uh, these do relate somehow to spin structures, and he was able to share his intuition. He said, well, every time you have a structure like this, it's probably like a quantization. So for example, how do you think of a point in a space? And this is your question, Harris, about like, well, what does a point mean, right? A point can mean different things and it probably can mean like eight different things. So that's like eight definitions of what a point can mean. And you have eight different ways of quantizing things maybe depending on... Um, depending on how you're, where you are in that eight cycle. Does that make sense, Thomas? I don't know if I was... 
Uh, I am not sure if I can follow that now. I mean, the jumps are too can... big. The jumps are too big. <laughs> yeah. But so to learn about, but are you familiar with different types of quantizations? Because I'm not, but are you familiar In with probably? In some right? way, yes. And John's not here, but like he's interested, like, so he'll have a theory where he says, well, why don't we, you know, you can break things up. Like one of the ways they look at quantum space is that they say, well, don't just look at where something is, but look at the direction it's moving. They'll say the momentum, right? Like it's got a position, it's got a momentum. So you'll have three dimensions for the position, but you'll have three dimensions for the momentum, like for the, where's it going? You get six dimensions. That's called phase space. And then you can say, well, I'd like to focus on position or I'd like to focus on momentum. So it's kind of like breaking up the six dimensional space into three and three, then choosing, let's say, which one you're going to focus on or whatever. And you, I'm not, I don't know what I'm talking about, but I'm just trying to share. So mm -hmm. um, it's um, criminal. I was a bit more, I was going to, ah, what's this? Uh, did you get that from now, or did you have it from before, Andrew? I made this today. I made this today oh, for, okay. for for to show you guys. So, okay, yeah. And I made this is a second slide. Maybe I'll just briefly show this one, and it kind of relates to what Thomas I think was asking about. Uh, do you see on top here? It says a uh, vect. It means the world of vector spaces, the category of vector spaces, and mm -hmm. set means the world of sets. So, they say category, but really I think world is a much better way to talk about it. Because it's not just sets, but it's set functions. So here's a picture of a set function. I got a set with two elements, J and K. And then this is a set of vectors. It could be three-dimensional. Let's Well, that's it's, it's a one-dimensional vector space. So it's, let's say one-dimensional, right? Like a line. But so line has all kinds of vectors on it, you know, just bazillions of, I mean, infinitely many, right? So if I have a set function, it's saying, okay, J is going to get mapped to some real number, basically, some vector. But a vector is going to be like a real number, like let's say plus three. Or maybe K will be mapped to minus two. So there's all these ways you could do that. That's in the world of sets. Now, I have a world of vector spaces. And I have matrices go from one vector space to another, like linear transformation. Are you familiar with like how matrices work? Or matrix multiplication? Bill, do you know about matrix multiplication? Or not really? Uh, no. We may work on that sometime. It's kind of, it takes some effort, but um, but you're familiar with vectors, right? So a vector, a matrix basically can say, I've got a vector pointing like this, but I want to rotate it maybe. Or maybe I want to stretch it. You know, I want to transform it, right? So that would be a matrix. So, so I can take a vector space and I can transform it into another vector space. I could collapse it. So for example, I can have a two-dimensional vector space, like a tabletop, uh, infinite tabletop, and I could collapse it. I could just ignore something, you know, and just say, I'm just going to be interested in the diagonal. I'm just going to be interested in one line. So this is a vector space with two generators. This is a vector space with one generator. This is a map. Now, it turns so, out that... What is, a, what is a generator? Is it J and K? What is the generator? Yeah, so yeah, this would be vectors. So like a generator would be like to say, I have a unit vector, let's say up, right? In the up direction. Okay. This will be one step. But so if you can tell me what one step is, then I can tell you what two and three and four, if I just keep adding them, right? Or subtracting them, right? Okay. It's the generator that tells me how to build the whole space. You just give me this one vector generator, right? Space mm -hmm. generator. I can make it times two, times one and a half, times three, times four. Does that make sense? It's a so is it, uh, I would call it independent directions. Independent directions. So yeah. is it in this X case. and Y? Are we talking well, about yeah, X and call y it X and Y? y. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, and then, but then V the vector space. What I remember because what I remember because I just now, Andrews, you said that the vector space, the V. The one generator is a number, right? And okay. I was like, I remember that always. Um, so this is through a certain transformation from all this high level maths that we've done, right? Because from mm -hmm. what I remember when I was doing my bachelor, the vector always has, well, a vector is on the vector space, like it's on the XYZ, it's like right. the you know, vector theory, right? It had, um, it was, 
okay, it can only be a real number if it's on the X line, or if we think of X, Y, Z, in X, Y, Z, exactly. I mean, yeah, so, so basically... you're turning the two, what we're doing here, if I've understood correctly, we're collapsing X, Y, or J, K into one dimension. Is that what yes. we're doing? Yes. Yeah, okay, you could okay. do that. I understand a, that. That's, it, that's fair. I did it because it's simple. It's a simple example. You know, I don't have a big page. So, you know, and I, I don't want, I want to do, what's the simplest example? So you have a two dimensional yeah. scene. I chose JK because, you know, this is like the part of math that's a social. It's so important for math to have a social community, you know, where you can talk about it. But like, yeah. so like a very common, you talked about X, Y, Z, three dimensions. So it's very common, like the unit uh, gen generators would be I, J, K. And a lot of times they put arrows on top. I didn't put arrows on top. I was too uh, lazy. I, but I made them bold. I used a different font, you know, courier. Right? So I didn't use I because the imaginary number is also called I, you know. So I thought I don't want to make it confusing. And like Clifford algebras have a bunch of I's in them also, you know, or et cetera. So depending on. So I just didn't use that. So I used J and K because and then to V. Now, when you connect these two worlds, you can connect them. And so this is like, this is happening on the math world, you know, the math mathematical plane, mathematical symbols. And so when they talk about vector spaces, they're not using their imagination. They're just using parentheses and saying, well, this will have uh, two slots. You know, this will have one slot between the parentheses. If it was three dimensionals, it would have three slots, you know, but they're just thinking in terms of mathematical symbols and slots and whatever. But we can uh, work on an imaginary level, like higher, it becomes kind of philosophical. We can say, oh, we've got these two worlds. There's a way to make a window, like a metaphor, basically. There's a way to make a metaphor that links these two worlds, that synchronizes them across a window, okay? So it won't match up the whole world, because these are set world and vector space world are very different. But we can make a window between two that'll where the pictures will match on either side. So one of the we need what are called functors because they need to carry over not just the objects or like here it's the spaces, but they need to carry over the arrows, the functions also from one world to the other world. So one will be called the forgetful functor. And it's very almost trivial. It just says, look, a vector space has all these assumptions about it, right? And, and this vector space has all these assumptions about it, right? Well, Here's a vector space with one generator. But if I forget that it's a vector space, it's just a set of vectors. Does that make sense? That means that, you know, when it's a vector space, it's got an addition rule. It's got a zero, zero plus, let's say, vector five equals vector five. It's got all this algebra. I can forget all the algebra. I'm just going to have a set. And I'm going to forget all these matrix stuff. No, I can just get a set. Hold on, hold on. Hold on, you're going a bit too fast. What's a set in this a, context? A set is like a collection of things. So a uh, it's a technical so basically term. Is, as opposed to the space, which is... Which has some kind of structure, maybe. Like, a, like for example, a space will have a notion typically of nearness. Are things near or not, right? Uh, a vector space will have a notion of, um, you know, addition or multiplication, right? Like you can make something twice as big. But if you have a set, a set could be like cow, pig, sheep, right? You can't add cow. I mean, the idea is that it doesn't really make sense to do this. It's just a bag of things. So a set could be like a two elements or five elements. So there's membership in a set. You're familiar with set, Bill? Are you? Do you know the idea? Uh, not as, yeah, we've covered it, yes. Yeah, okay. So basically to say, forget about all the fancy algebra, you just have a set. That's called the forgetful function. Now it turns out that if you do that on this end and on the other end, take, so you do that to the thing that let's say is on the, it's called, it's on the right-hand side. You know, you have this function. I'm going to do it to the thing on the right-hand side and land over here. And to balance that, I'm going to take this, this is a set with two elements, and I'm going to map it over here with the free functor. And the free functor is going to say that these two elements are going to become two generators for vector space dimensions. I had two elements here. I'm going to get two dimensions over here. So now I got like all these vectors here.
But this is like the mama and the papa of all these vectors here, these two dimensionals. There's going to be a mama dimension and a papa dimension, right? And all, you know, so there's going to be 2J, 3J, 5J, K, you know, 2K, uh, 3K plus 4J. You can do all kinds of combinations, but it all came from here. So there's this very, it's seemingly complicated thing that said you had a, a bag with a mama and a papa, and you they made a whole family of vectors that's two dimensional. That's straightforward, but it's just, you know, and it turns out that it's the same information. When you forget this, the things you forgot balance the things you create. That may be hard for you to understand, but Thomas, does that make sense to you? Not really. Okay, so that was what these functors were all about. Can does it make sense that you can have a, uh, you can forget what a yes. vector space is and make it a set? Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. So the, does it make sense that you can go back and say, well, I have a set, but I'm going to, there's a, there's a natural way to create a vector space from a set with two elements. You just say that those are going to be my generators. If, if, if presuming that you're, you have a field that's the reals, let's say, right? But yeah, but you have to give in the structure that, you know, I want to create a vector space, which has now this in the structure, then there's a way of regaining it. I could exactly. understand it too, yes. Yeah, and so the idea is that forgetting and regaining turned out to be, in many, many cases, it, it turned out to be perfectly balanced. And so the way you can see the balance, and that's what this hom, do you remember from the Yoneda lemma, this hom of fy comma x, hom mm -hmm. y comma gx? Thomas, I told you about that. This is basically a way, way of yes. sets of arrows, yeah. Mm -hmm. See, so what it's saying, it's saying that if this came from the free functor, this part here, and I map it into any vector space, well, that will be the same structurally as taking these two set, this this taking any set, let's say the original set here, and mapping it to the set that gets when I forget this. So like this map would say, okay, I have a set with two elements. What the map does is it gives me two, two, two vectors, right? I mean, this is a this is a vector on one generator. So it's uh, two real numbers basically, right? That this map is saying, give me two elements and I will get two real numbers. This map is saying, give me two generators and I will get, um, oh, I will map this generator to the reals and I will map this generator to the reals. It's the same sophistication. Does that make sense to you, Thomas? To the sophi sophistication, yes, but when I have the set of vectors, uh, I don't know how. If I map a set of two elements to a set of vectors, I for me, I don't see this information regaining the projection of the vector spaces that I had before. It's like, I am not sure. Well, okay, so just to try to say it one more time and see if you understand. The idea is that this map matches up with this map. So like these HOM sets is isomorphic to these HOM sets. And of course, it's a little bit more complicated because you have to look at compositions. But yes. basically it's saying that de this determination saying, okay, you got two, a set with two elements and you're gonna have to give me two real numbers, right? That determination is isomorphic to this determination saying, I've got two generators here and I need to map them to this uh, copy of the reals. You know, so this generator will have to go to real number and this generator will have to go to a real number. The determination is basically isomorphic. And so the those determinations are isomorphic, but the way they're related is that going this way, I took the set and I used the free generation to get me a vector space with two generators. Going the other way, I took this vector space and I forgot it was a vector space. I got a, but I got a huge set. You see, I got a huge set. Uh, this is one generator, but the set is huge. But it turns out that they balance each other that way. It's a, it's like a window between these two worlds. And it's only a small window because, you know, it, it, the sets have lots of other stuff going on. And then the, the vector space has lots of other stuff going on. But if you just focus on these arrows that have this form here, you'll get matching windows. 
Does that kind of make Somewhere? sense, Thomas? Or that's what an adjunction is. Uh, and it, it's kind of like it must have some similar to a junction, like adjoints in uh, vec in like quantum mechanics. You know, when you have a, it's the form is very similar. Uh, but in quantum mechanics, I can write it down explicitly with the mass, <laughs> and there my experience tells me how I can interpret it, how I can understand it. Whereas with the free words, mm -hmm. the intuition fails me. So we have to build up. So that's it. Like it's again this problem, like the world of math. And then how do you build up imagination? Where can you do that? But the one of the ways that we're building imagination, is you realize that the left-hand side functor and the right-hand side functor is very different character. The, mm -hmm. In this case, the left one, like the, the forgetful one, which is I call G, is trivial. But this one is very elaborate, you know, but they turn out to be matching up. So what he was doing, he was saying that in the world of Clifford algebras, and what Clifford algebras basically are, they're basically like the binomial theorem. You know, take the Pascal's triangle, pick a particular level, like we're saying, x cubed plus uh, x cubed plus uh, x squared y plus y squared plus y squared. Uh, that's basically saying, like, I'm going to have generators. Like, um, I could use all three, e1, e2, e3, Multiply them, or I could use two of them, E1, E2, and e, E1, E3, and E2, E3, or I could use one of them, like E1, or E2, or E3, or I could use none of them. I just have the reals. The binomial theorem spells that out. So you have that uh, Clifford algebra world, like some level, you are, you are some level on the Pascal's triangle. Basically, he's saying, like, once you get to the eighth level, it's almost like you were back at the zeroth level for all practical purposes. You know, as far as you can tell, you're it only goes eight levels deep in the mind, let's say, or in the or in the the, the, the imagination or something like that. And the, the levels are hooked up by this type of thing, where when you go from the smaller world to the bigger world, or when you go from the bigger world to the smaller world, you forget basically. And then when you go back, you get this, uh, when you go back, you get this grasmani, you get this structure. So this structure is like the opposite of forgetting. But each time you're in a different level of Pascal's triangle, you're getting a new type of, um, you're getting a new type of thing. So every time you make a choice, you know, you're getting like a new type of uh, qualitative um, thing. So anything, does that make any kind of sense? But that's what I got from it. Um, on the level of your, to some extent, philosophy discussion, it makes sense. It sounds maybe believable, but on the mathematical level, I cannot. No, I don't either. <laughs> reproduce it. It's... But so one of the new things I learned from him was that uh, so in physics we could look for quantizations, and basically it's saying like there's something about different types of physical spa phase space. Let's say you know where where mm -hmm. where they become more and more elaborate in some way, cognitively. So that's, uh... okay, we have like maybe four or five minutes left. Maybe just something happy anybody wants to say uh, or? One minute, minute 20 seconds. A minute and a half. Um, Thomas, wasn't there a thing in physics where you, it's not optimization, but where you put set the, the parameter to one, like the metric to one, that's what it reminded me this going back to the JK, the left JKs, like the when they became the metric, there was something that we used to sort of like say, we're going to do this operation and it's going to become like whatever the length is, we're going to treat it as being our unit now. Now, last thing, and I'll say it says less than a minute. Andrews, you're going to convince me that I'm going to, that I know category theory is the way you're going because I understood um Part of what I did in the initial paper that I sent you that maybe I, that could be framed as conforming with some of these things that you talked about here, like this um, JK, the square and making, you know, that was what I was trying to do with the circles and the radiuses. And okay, so we'll continue. So I just want to thank continue. our viewers and say we had fun. Thank uh, God for trying to be family peace and love for math for wisdom